and then we're live right now. And uh, for anybody watching the video at this point, you should know that we've just set up the live stream five minutes early. So you might want to fast forward the video if you're watching it after the fact uh, for five minutes when the program will officially begin. But I uh, have turned on the live stream now. I'm with uh, Professor Charlie Tart, and uh, we will begin uh, our formal program in five minutes. Do we stand here doing nothing for five minutes? Well, we can chat. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that the, the people who uh, uh, happen to tune in early uh, or, or the people who watch the yeah, archive video will understand that okay. uh, the way this is being done. And oh, you know what else I might do? I think I'm going to turn, I'm going to make a recording on my end as well on the, of the Zoom. And I am going to make sure that, uh, if I can, that the YouTube setting, that YouTube, I'm pretty sure I already did set it up, that YouTube makes uh, a recording themselves. YouTube is telling me we have an excellent connection. Can I record also? So we'll have a backup in case anything goes wrong with the original recording? Um, if you do make a recording, make it on your computer. I okay. think you have the choice rather than the cloud. Yes. Okay. The, you as the host have to give me permission to record. Oh, all right. Let's see what I can do here. I ha have to give you permission. Recording. Let's see. Um, wonder where I give you permission. So just from my days as a radio engineer, I like to have backups to sure. make sure things don't go wrong. Uh, I'm happy to give you permission, Charlie, but I don't see where <laughs> I, I'm to do that. Uh, let me... Well, all right. If, if it's too complicated, we can forget it. Um, yeah, I don't... I don't... I don't see how. Uh, but your your screen is telling you that I have to give you permission? Uh-huh. When I hover over record, I have the choice of recording on this computer. And when I click that, it says, please ask the host to give you permission to record. OK. Well. Let's see. Okay. Um, allow participants to see. I mean, here is permissions, and I can give you permission to share screen, chat, rename yourself, unmute yourself. And I, I will give you permission to share screen. That's all. Try it now. Let's see if that worked. Permission to rename myself. That sounds very exciting. <laughs> I still need permission to record. That's all right. Okay. Okay. You've you've got your recording. That's what. I, I there are two recordings I think that are being made right now, one on YouTube and and one on my computer. I've and, never had permission to remain myself before. I've always had to just work at it. <laughs> it, it does remind me of a funny story. I was going to visit uh, parapsychologist Bob Morris in Edinburgh once. And he was out of town, but his wife, Joanne, was going to meet my wife, Judy, and I when our train got in. And I had met her once a few years before, and I didn't quite remember what she looked like, so I had to assume she'd recognize me. And as we got out and stood on the platform, I found what I was doing, I was trying to look like myself. Now, that's <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to make it easier. And she recognized me, so I guess it worked. Yeah. Okay, it is exactly three o'clock mountain time right now. So let me welcome those of you who are uh, viewing. 
Uh, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, your host. I'm with Professor Charlie Tart, who has um, been a friend and a mentor of mine for nearly half a century. Charlie is a Professor Emeritus at the University of California at Davis in psychology. He is the author of the classic anthology, Altered States of Consciousness. And I, I remember the day when I was a Berkeley student where if, if you were to walk on campus, you, almost everybody was carrying that book. Back, I, I believe it was published in 68 or 69. It was uh, yeah. practically required reading for the entire city of Berkeley, it, it seems to me. Yeah. Doc, Dr. Tart is also a, a student of transpersonal psychology, of meditation. Uh, we've done a, about 10 interviews that are in the Thinking Aloud archives right now. And um, what we'll be doing is uh, fielding your questions for the next 90 minutes or so. And the questions are coming in already, so uh, we'll get started. Singular Understanding asks, Dear Doctor, thank you for your sustained efforts to broaden the scientific perspective. However, it goes painstakingly slow. Yeah. I would hope that those involved who are called fringe could form some sort of consortium to specifically make a very sharp petition to the scientific community at large to finally be taken seriously. Do you think such a consortium could be formed? What a perfect question to start off with because Several colleagues and I who are all interested in the nature of consciousness uh, just a year or so ago formed the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Material Science. Doesn't that sound like something official? I mean, it's just a few of us so far, but we do have a membership categories. And we're basically trying to have a professionally respectable scientific group that young investigators particularly can feel like they can join and mention their membership in, and it's clearly respectable, not some fringe sort of thing. Now, how much of a difference that will make? We hope it makes a big difference because there are a lot of younger scientists out there who are very interested in parapsychology, the nature of consciousness, stuff like that, but they know that there's so much prejudice against even investigating stuff like that. They have to be very careful about their image if they want to get ahead. So we're hoping this uh, academy will make it easier for them. You can find the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Science on the web. I can't quite remember the URL, but just put those words in, Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Science, and you'll get there, find out what membership involves and stuff like that. Is that academy uh, going to be uh, doing what he suggested, make a very sharp petition to the scientific community at large? No, petitioning won't do any good, okay? What we want to do is get more bright people involved in these investigations until we have the kind of breakthroughs that will force people to pay attention. You know, if you look at the history of unusual things coming into science, there's a common history of first, nobody pays attention to it or says that's total nonsense that anybody would be interested in that stuff. And as the evidence and, and maybe even applications keep piling up, they eventually say, well, there's a little effect there, but it's not really important. So of course we weren't paying much attention. And then as the data gets even better and it becomes practically useful, the mainstream will say, actually, we discovered it first. <laughs> so that, that's, you know, it's not the ideal way science is supposed to operate, but scientists are people. Sometimes I'm amazed that stubborn, biased, bullheaded people like us human beings can actually make any advances in our knowledge. But by gosh, if you do science right, it makes us look at actual facts instead of just being attached to our opinions and we get somewhere. Here's a question 
from uh, one of our volunteers, Laura Hovey Newbert, who asks, is meditation the first step to awakening? Is there always something to be gained for the per person attempting this process? What are the dangers inherent in the waking up process for the individual? Jeff, you didn't warn me that there would be really, really difficult questions being asked. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. First problem, what does meditation mean? What does awakening mean? What does the words like enlightenment mean? You'll find these words are coming into more common use, but if you try to figure out what people mean by it, they often mean quite different things. So meditation is almost getting popular now as a way to relax. Well, that's good. Being overly tense doesn't help people. Uh, being totally relaxed, I suspect, would be just as bad as being overly tense. But to be able to be as kind of an optimal level of paying attention, thinking clearly, and so forth, that's good. But of course, she's thinking about meditation as leading to some kind of spiritual enlightenment. So what's spiritual enlightenment? Whoa. I, I've written a lot on what that word might mean, uh, always qualifying it as whatever it is. It's not me, so I'm speculating. <laughs> you know? But I do sometimes think my work is maybe an expert on endarkenment. It's quite clear that we can take this wonderful mind of ours, which is capable of perceiving and thinking and learning so much, and using it in stupid, crazy ways that produce a lot of suffering, unnecessary suffering, because we don't have to get ex that upset about things. Uh, an example I sometimes give is suppose you have the delusion that people are always judging your clothing and are you dressed well enough and fashionably enough? <clears throat> you can tell that doesn't apply to me. That's <clears throat> That's not one of my delusions. Well, most of the time, people who happen to glance your way don't actually pay any attention to you at all. But if you're worrying about what they think about your stylishness, your suffering, you're getting tense for no good reason at all. Uh, it's real suffering, but I tend to think oh, of it as useless suffering. And are you dressed well enough and fashionably enough? <clears throat> you can tell that doesn't apply to me. That's <clears throat> that's. Not how interesting. I hear myself being repeated with a time lag. Uh, yeah, that uh, was my fault. I hope it stopped at this point. It's, it's stopped, but it's very interesting. <laughs> okay. Now, if, if I were overly attached, do we have to produce a technically perfect show? I would suffer about that. But instead, I found it amusing. Let me just uh, double check, Charlie. <laughs> I hope I think we're still on, uh, I'm just, yes, yes, we're still going. We're still going. I thought for a moment there was a, a technical problem be, because I was playing around with the controls, but uh, we're good. Okay, I'll, so, I'll take more of a stab at enlightenment then, all right? Okay. Um, a lot of people have noticed that there is an enormous amount of suffering in human life. Some of it is suffering that it's just built into the way we are. You know, if you break your leg, it's going to hurt. That's the way the nervous system is wired. Uh, if you worry about how you're dressed, well, that may be actually important in certain situations where you're trying to influence somebody. But if you're overly attached to that, that's a lot of useless suffering. So one of the questions has been, how do you reduce the suffering in your life? One of the answers put forward in various religions is that if you stop doing these sort of neurotic kinds of things, over attachment to, to wrong ideas, that will reduce suffering. And I think that's generally true. Psychotherapy could be considered a form of enlightenment in that case, because it teaches people something about not putting their energy into unrealistic views of reality and so forth. But there's another view of enlightenment that has to do with experiencing altered states of consciousness of one sort or another, in which you see the true nature of yourself and the world in a profound way 
and you see that it's good. The people who experience this either talk about how they can't really describe it. It was a big experience that's totally changed their life. Or they may try to explain it in terms of some religious or spiritual system they're already familiar with. So, you know, I talked with God and was blessed or something like that. That, that sounds good, but it, it, what exactly does that mean? So we can't, you know, this gets into the whole question of how you deal with altered states of consciousness with those kind of experiences. They're real. They can be very valuable. They can be crazy making. Uh, one of the reasons I published my altered states of consciousness book back in 1969 was to try to show that we knew a little bit about altered states of consciousness, hypnosis, dreams, meditation, and so forth. But at the same time, there was so much we didn't know. One of the strange mixed reaction I had was that for about 25 years, my altered states of consciousness book remained the most authoritative book on what we scientifically knew about altered states of consciousness. And in one sense, I was proud to have put the right stuff together. But in another sense, I was so disappointed because I had hoped it would inspire enough new research that our actual knowledge would have leaped ahead enormously. I think we're getting ready to move ahead on actual knowledge again. We're learning a little more about meditation, for instance, but there's so much we need to learn. So, and again, people who say they've experienced enlightenment will say they can't explain it. Uh, they're very worried about people who are glib like me who go on as if they could explain it. So that's why I remind people I'm not enlightened. I don't know what it really is. Maybe little touches of it sometimes in some altered states experiences I've had. So I know there's something there, but to actually reach those levels of development, I don't know. And whether those levels of development actually then result in a person contributing to the world, I don't know. A, a question I think about sometime, who was more, who was of more benefit to the world, the Buddha or Anthony von Leeuwenhoek? Most people would say who, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek? Well, the Buddhists have come up with a psychological system that reduces the suffering for a lot of people and may eliminate it almost entirely for some. But von Leeuwenhoek is one of the people who invented the microscope and wiped out diseases like malaria. So there's a lot of people still alive who would be dead otherwise. That's quite a contribution. So that gets into the whole question of is enlightenment practical or is it just, does it just make you feel good? If I've raised more questions in people's mind than answered anything, that's good because I think that's a realistic way to think about our knowledge now. Some good questions, not much in the way of answers. I remember many years ago, and, and viewers today still remind me about it. I interviewed a fellow named U.G. Chris, Krishnamurti, not Jedu Krishnamurti. Um, but he had written a book called The Mystique of Enlightenment. And he basically claimed that there really is no such thing as enlightenment, that people are chasing after an illusion. Uh, he recommended people stop even trying to get enlightened. Uh, how do you feel about that, Charlie? Uh, in a lot of cases, I'm sure that's true. Uh, one of the sources of mystical experience I've been inspired reading sometimes is this Book, the Course of Miracles. And one of the interesting lines in there is something like, those who seek the light are merely covering their eyes. The light is in them. It's in them now. It is just a matter of recognizing, not creating something. Well, I'm sure that's one useful way to think about it, and it may help some people experience something more deeply. But yeah, we can certainly have delusions about enlightenment too. But be careful when you talk yourself out of something. Back in graduate school, I was one of the people who started doing research on dreams when we discovered there were brainwave correlates. And so you could get a lot of dreams during in the lab at night instead of just waiting on reports from long ago. And while I was researching the background material, I read a book by a philosopher who argued quite logically and coherently that there were no such things as dreams. 
well, how was I going to do my research on dreams if there weren't any such thing? I had nightmares about it all night. So I'm always careful of uh, apparent reasoning that says you can't get there. To recognize you can have nutty, distorted ideas about it. Yeah, that's very important. Okay, here's a question from Tantleon One. He says, do you agree with the idea of panpsychism? He would have to tell me what he means by panpsychism. That's one of those big philosophical words that I'm very impressed by, and I see it used in a lot of different contexts, and I'm not really sure what's meant by it. Maybe, maybe he'll write something in again to come back to later as, as to what he means by panpsychism. Okay. Uh, well, he did, he did pose a, a follow-up question. Maybe that will help. Huh? He said, do you think parapsychology would benefit from animal studies? I, he says he knows there's been some with Ryan and Sheldrake. And if, if you think animal studies would be useful, what would they look like? You ask a researcher, would more research be useful? The answer is always yes. But I think realistically, the answer is probably yes. But it's actually not as simple a question as you think. There have been a number of parapsychological experiments, well controlled and all that, where animals have shown behavior that implied that somehow they picked up information in a paranormal way. They couldn't get the relevant information in a normal way, but they got it anyway. But then the question started rising, who was psychic, the animal or the researcher? Was the researcher being psychic and influencing the animal in order to make the experiment they had gotten attached to come out? I'm not saying that's an impossible barrier, but I think it sort of discouraged people you know, there is no, it's, it's not a simple matter of just testing animals instead of people and it will be less complicated. What's really complicated is the researcher. Parapsychology has been really held back by a desire to be accepted as part of conventional science and translating that to mean that we have to look like conventional science, okay? So if somebody's doing a physics or a chemistry experiment, for instance, they can tell you what their apparatus was like, what they did, what the results were. And you don't have to know what their mood was when they did the experiment or what they believe about certain kinds of things, because we think we're dealing with totally impersonal laws. But once you start dealing with the idea that we can contact each other in parapsychological ways, telepathy or clairvoyance or something like that, you can't ignore the experiment. The experimenter is part of the experiment. That goes against the idea of, gosh, we're just ordinary scientists. We're totally objective, totally logical and all that. So a lot of parapsychological experiments, people have argued quite well, may have shown you that certain experimenters are pretty psychic themselves, but they don't want to express it, so they make it look as if it's coming from their subjects. Now, I, that's certainly not universally true, but it may be true in certain senses. Uh, we do have some parapsychologists who always get quite significant results. Uh, others almost never get significant results. That's the big problem, and it's a huge problem because, of course, it doesn't apply just in parapsychology. It applies in ordinary psychological experiments. A lot of apparent findings about just the way the mind naturally works have to do with hidden communication between experimenters and subjects in experiments. Psychologists don't like this idea. We'll, we'll lose our status, and be said, be out in the economics department or something like that. Okay, here's um, a question from another one of our volunteers, Emmy Vadness, who asks, in, in your career, what has surprised you the most or stood out the most in your studies of consciousness? Well, it's interesting. Um, I was just writing something like that as part of a discussion with colleagues. So I'll tell you a little story. Years ago, I guess 
getting on toward half a century, the 1970s, I was in a psychological spiritual growth group out here in California with the psychiatrist Claudio Naranjo, and we did all sorts of conventional spiritual growth exercises as well as various psychological growth exercises because he realized that our psychology often was in the way of anything spiritual being experienced. And at one point he got intrigued with a new kind of therapy that had been invented by a tailor who lived in Oakland, a man named Bob Hoffman. And Bob Hoffman was also a medium. He contacted spirits, or at least that was his experience. I don't know whether he really did or not, but his experience was that he contacted the just surviving spirit of this deceased psychoanalyst, a Dr. Fisher. And Dr. Fisher was unhappy in the afterlife because he realized he hadn't been able to help most of his patients in this life very much. The kind of therapy he did wasn't very efficient. It took a long time and whatnot. And he had come up with a better kind of therapy. And Claudia Naranjo was adapting this to work in a group setting so that it could remove some of the psychological blocks for things. And to start this therapy going, he brought this fellow, Bob Hoffman, into one of our group meetings one night to describe this therapy to us. Well, he walked in and within five minutes, I said to myself, this guy's no psychic, this guy's a phony. He's full of himself, uh, he's opinionated, um, he's not very smart, he's certainly not psychic. This is ridiculous. On the other hand, I had a lot of confidence in Claudio Naranjo, very smart psychiatrist, one of the leaders of new kinds of therapies and stuff. So I, I went through the therapy, which was something we did with each other for, oh gosh, eight or 10 weeks, something like that. The very last session in this new kind of therapy, where you supposedly had now learned a lot about how your childhood experiences had shaped your life, particularly because of your parents' faults and strengths. He brought Bob Hoffman in for a final session in which we would be able to forgive our parents because we realized, yeah, they were bad in a lot of ways, but they did the best they could and they did love us. Okay, so they brought Bob Hoffman in to lead this thing. He walked in the room. I looked at him and realized, oh my God, I have no idea what this person is actually like. Because when I saw him 10 weeks ago, all my unresolved problems about my father were projected on him because he had a number of mannerisms like my father. And although I was a psychologist, I knew intellectually about projection and stuff like that. I had been taken over by it, wasn't aware of it at all. And wow. From now on, I really had to be aware of the possibility of projection in myself. I got flaws. They're big flaws. If I watch them, I can maybe do something about them. That was very, very surprising, to put it mildly. And it isn't a, a direct experimental thing or something like that, but since I'm the person who's done all my various experiments, I don't know how much projection may have influenced things. I've always tried to do them as objectively as possible, but now I always wonder. A wonderful story. Uh, and wonderful in a sense, but doesn't reflect well on me, but anyway. Well, if, you know, if the most important lesson is to learn about yourself, that, I would think that's a good thing. Oh, yes, yes. The result was excellent. Here's a question from Dr. Fernando Salvino. He asks, what is the implication, I think that's what he means, about cosmic consciousness, what is the implication of cosmic consciousness for the health of the planet, the eco-social crisis that we're in? If, if more people experience Cosmic consciousness, will that address some of the planetary crises? I think that's what he's asking. Oh, thank you. You're asking an excellent question because you're getting to the core of my professional and personal work. Um, 
I needn't say that this world is in bad shape. We humans have a lot of nasty characteristics that may destroy the whole place. So we can tell people to be good. We can punish them when they're bad, try to reward them when they're good. We can try to build in psychological mechanisms that will make it more likely they'll be good. For instance, the fear of being shamed in front of their friends if they do something that's nasty to someone with less power than them and so forth. And these help, but they're far from perfection. Now, what really interests me about mystical experiences like cosmic consciousness is one prime example, is the feeling of deep connection people have with an intelligent, loving universe that includes not only God, quote unquote, don't ask me what I mean by God, but it's something really big, and with every other living being. The consequence of that is that this is not just an experience and then you come back to your normal self. In most cases, it lasts and you feel a deeper real connection with other people. Well, now you're not good because you're supposed to be good or you're, you'll be punished if they catch you and you're not being good and so forth. You're good because everybody else is part of you. And you don't hit yourself in the head. Well, actually some people do, but that's another side trip. So the only sensible thing to do is to be kinder and more understanding of people. So that means to me, we need to know how to make something like cosmic consciousness available to large numbers of people. I mean, if you ask me how many people in the world have experienced it now, I don't know, one in a million, one in a thousand, not enough for it to have major effects on the world. Most of us are out there looking for number, looking out for number one. But if a much larger number of people could in safe ways experience this feeling of union with the love and intelligence of the universe and be transformed in this way, I think the world would change drastically. Oh, it also has another effect of just living in accordance with these values makes your life very satisfying. You don't have to have enormous amount of physical wealth that the planet has to be raped to provide you. It's just living according to these loving values is good. But again, I don't want to have this just trained into people by instilling fear, okay? You know, if you make people be good because you tell them they're gonna to go to hell if you're not good, well, that'll have some effect, although that probably makes some people rebel even more strongly than they would otherwise. But the direct feeling of some kind of love it really transforms people. Okay, I wanna know what is that love? How do you train people to get it? What are the blocks for people experiencing it? How do you help them integrate it into your life and so forth? A lot can be done and I think it will help the world. So, you know, I've done experiments around different aspects of those sort of things. Um, if we really are connected with each other people deeply, for instance, the parapsychological work becomes very important because that's an example of connections that transcend this material separation. So the idea that our happiness is intertwined with that of everybody on the planet yeah, we call that telepathy. We've demonstrated it in the laboratory. It's not just a weird idea. Something real is going on there. That's that's a formidable question. Here's uh, another question from uh, Laura Newbert. She says that Joseph Campbell alludes to the idea he calls essential schizophrenia as a precursor or uh, even as a method of awakening. And uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, that idea? I love the, the medical terminology it's put, it's put in to make it sound more respectable. <laughs> uh, precursors, my goodness. I'd need to know, I, I don't know Joseph Campbell's work that well. I'd need to know more of what he meant by a sort of controlled schizophrenia. Um, 
you can certainly push people to have experiences like this. So for example, one of the most powerful mystical experiences that a person can have is the near death experience. The problem is that near part is very tricky. Most people who come that near to death don't tell you about a wonderful experience, they get buried. So, you know, I would, I would not be for doing terrible things to people to put them really close to death because they might have a wonderful experience that would make them a more enlightened human being. We gotta find safer ways of doing it. Okay, here's a fascinating question from Julie Tasker, who talks about remote influencing for the highest good and greatest benefit. And she wonders, do you, in, in your personal practice, connect with angels or ascended masters or guides of, of any sort in the inner world? <laughs> I'm a respectable scientist. How could I do that? Now, I'm talking about one aspect of this question here that's really very important, okay? I think scientific research can be really helpful. It will tell us things that a strictly spiritual approach won't show us. Um, give you an example. I've watched some movies lately that show young Buddhist monks being trained to be monks. And among other things, they memorize various scriptures until they can just pull them out of memory under all sorts of difficult circumstances. And on the one hand, I think, ah, yes, they, they've got the truth. Well, if you're absolutely convinced that Buddhism has all the truth, then making young kids memorize these, these truths so it will influence them sounds like a pretty good idea. But suppose there, there's a lot of truth in there and there was more of it in the kind of social conditions that were around at the time of the Buddha, but you're also really concretizing their mind and so they can't see how things are different then you're getting people who may seem spiritual, who do things are con conventionally considered good, but are they able to see subtle differences in things now that maybe a different approach would be needed? So to just try to push an experience on people, um, experiences of discovery, yeah. So they, people have to be able to say, no, I don't see it that way. Or uh, no, I can I, I see it that way, but I think that it means something else. As to angels, if I had saw an angel and mentioned it to anyone, I'd be kicked out of the scientific community. And my ability to influence some scientists would be cut. Uh, so if I were visited by an angel, stay away, folks. <laughs> I would never reveal it. And the truth is, no, I don't, I don't think that's happened. At, at least not in any conventional sense. I'm, I'm very aware that I have to behave in a way that is limited, the way I just complained about, so that these young Buddhist monks were being trained. But it gives me a certain power to influence important people who have an effect on the nature of the world, on how the world develops. And I would not throw that away. So I, I don't use, I don't go to psychics to get advice on what to do next. For instance, I have, I've had friends who were good psychics who once in a while say something, but I don't seek that out. And um, yeah. It's, it's not the direction it would be appropriate for me to go in. And, and I do have a prayer every once in a while on the order of, well, God, if you need to visit me, uh, could, could you kind of come gently and not scare the crap out of me by <laughs> manifesting too hard and too soon? Uh, I'm, I'm giving you the real human side of this. It's, it's tricky. Okay, thank you for that answer, Charlie. Well, here's a related question uh, from Erlen. 
he asks you, based on your research so far, what can you tell us about love? <laughs> oh, boy. I'd love to be able to tell you about love. Uh, I don't think of myself as an authority on love. I have tried to become a more loving person all my life. I think I'm, I'm a nice guy. I, I wouldn't hold myself up as an authority on love or as someone who's obviously just manifesting so much love that it makes a difference. So I'm, I'm going to bow out of that question that would activate my ego and distort the hell out of anything I said. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, here is a question from Guillermo Paleas, who asked. I, I do want to thank her for that question. It's a very relevant question, and someday it will have to be dealt with, but not today. Go ahead. Well, I could mention parenthetically for people who follow our listings, I actually have a uh, monologue which will be uh, released, I think, on Tuesday, uh, in which I uh, discuss the book by Pitaram Sorokin called The Ways and Power of Love. He really uh, did a lot of academic research on love. And I think his book, which that book I'm talking about was published in 1954. It's still a classic, one of the very best scientific studies about altruistic love and its potential for, amongst other things, uh, achieving world peace. Uh, but let's move on. Here's a question from uh, Guillermo Paleas. Since I've heard Dr. Tart was part of a Gurdjieff group, I'd like to know his thoughts about the nature of, now the word here is conscience, although I think he maybe means consciousness, I'm not sure. Is there any possibility of conscience to have a material quality? Wow. Um, okay, let me, let me qualify this. I have found Gurdjieff's teachings about becoming more awake extremely valuable, and they've been, I would call it a primary path for me. And I've, I actually have a course available on the web that's labeled as a meditation course, but really is primarily about developing more awareness and consciousness in everyday life. Because after all, you very seldom get into trouble when you're sitting there cross-legged meditating, but ordinary life, we open our mouth and get in trouble all the time. So being more awake there is really important. Now, I draw heavily on Gurdjieff in that course without mentioning him by name too much. I, I, I try to phrase things so that it won't push people's buttons, okay? But when I read Gurdjieff, I can roughly divide his teachings into two categories. One are what I call primarily psychological and experiential teachings. And most of them I can say, oh yeah, I've noticed that. Uh, that's true. And that, that's a useful way to think about that sort of thing, or that's a useful direction to develop something in. The other are his cosmological teachings about the higher levels of being and all that. And I, I put them aside as maybe it's true and maybe it's nonsense. I don't have the capacity to distinguish. So I don't really say anything. He talks about something about conscience also. So I'm not sure where the that's a misspelling of consciousness or not. Um, our ordinary consciousness, we certainly could make the distinction between superego, as Freud meant it, which a lot of that is basically your social conditioning, what you find acceptable and non-acceptable. And it may help you adapt to the particular society you live in, but it may not be universally applicable. You know. Um, one, one of the things when I'm, I'm remembering back to going to Sunday school when I was a kid and being taught that God was a God of love 
and also being taught that God was a vengeful God. And when you sinned, he not only punished you, he punished the sinner, the sinner's children, and the sinner's children's children down to, I think it was the seventh generation, or maybe it was just the fourth. And I remember thinking, wow, he's mean. I, I can hardly hold a grudge overnight and for generation after generation. But that I later saw that as actually as saying something about our socialization. We've had a lot of things conditioned into us that were very appropriate four generations ago. And they don't work that well now, but gosh, that, that's traditions we have to honor and things like that. That kind of conscience, that kind of superego conscience is well worth psychological work on to discover what's realistic, what's not realistic, what consequences it has for you and the like. I believe he also spoke about conscience in some much deeper form as an inherent knowing from our spiritual nature of what's right and wrong. And I hope he's right. I hope that that's in there. But I don't have any direct feeling for that. So I don't think I can say anything about it. And But good luck on going deeper into it. I, I really respect Gurdjieff, incidentally, as uh, saying a lot of stuff that was relevant to people living in our lives. You know, the, a lot of the spiritual stuff that was meant for monks and nuns, it's hard to apply it when you live a busy life. But Gurdjieff was talking about becoming more awake, more enlightened in everyday life when you're talking, uh, when you're doing things like now. So, for instance, because of Gurdjieff, once in a while, I can recognize that I'm getting ready to say something that's going to sound very spiritual. And actually, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about there. It, let me stop. <laughs> not, not say that particular thing. It's been very useful that way. Give me yeah. another question, Jeff. Okay, <laughs> yes. Here's a question from Shadow Wolf. He asks, how would you go about either training someone or self-training to cultivate psychokinetic or remote viewing capabilities? As to psychokinetic abilities, I don't know what would be a really effective sort of thing. I've, I've read a few things by a few people who claim they have trained themselves um, but whether they got genuine psychokinesis or whether they got it and it was a training system that worked for them and might work for somebody else who was the same kind of person but doesn't fit other people, I don't know. As to remote viewing, there are a, there's a lot of information available on how to remote view. I was a consultant on the original remote viewing project and kept informed by it. Um, a lot of people have remote viewed very successfully. Now, th this is getting into tricky territory here because once remote viewing got popular, some people figured out, I can make a lot of money by claiming to train people to remote view and they have weekend courses or the like that claim to teach you that. But when you look at it from a scientific perspective, you say, no, wait a minute. I think they're giving people cues as to what the right answer is, which may make the students feel good, but that's not remote viewing. That's, that's the wrong thing and you pay good money for it. But it's not like I have studied all the different remote viewing courses that can say this one is good, that one is bad and so forth. Read the original books by Putoff and Targ, Harold Putoff, Russell Targ, they describe how it's done. The important thing, the most important thing is to open yourself to do it and to not let your thinking mind get involved. To not say, oh, uh, big shiny surface, it must be a plate glass window. Uh, once you start analyzing things, that tends to interfere with the flow of extrasensory information. But really go back to the original book by Putoff and Targ, uh, Russell Targ has written several books since then on how to remote view. Stephen Schwartz has written excellent books on how to remote view. Get it, get the information from people who are much more involved in this than me. 
Here's an interesting question. Uh, the questioner uh, has called themselves the self and uh, the self writes to counter the love question. What about fear in relation to spiritual development? What about fear? I hate fear. It's, it's the emotion I just like the most. Um, <clears throat> To, but, but you can't ignore it, okay? I mean, I said earlier, you know, I think if you're, you act good because you're afraid of going to hell and other people have really warned you of that, I don't think that's a terribly solid basis. On the other hand, if otherwise you wouldn't do anything to make yourself a better person, that's tricky. Uh, when I was about, I don't know, 16, something like that, there was a free show one night of electrical wonders in my town. And I was very much into electrical and stuff, ham radio and things like that. So I went to see it. And it was wonderful. He had Tesla coils and all sorts of things where sparks leaped and all that. I really enjoyed it. And then he started mentioning more about Jesus. And by the time he had gotten into an hour into this show, I was practically ready to walk up front to be saved. And some part of me knew that this man, and I mean, I was just a 16 year old kid. I was not sophisticated. This man was emotionally sophisticated and basically he was raping me. He was using feelings of fear and hope and things like that to manipulate me. And luckily I got up and walked out of there and then was able to recognize what went on. So fear is widely used in spiritual circles. And I can see, I don't even like to say this, but I can see sometimes when it's helpful, uh, you know, if, if you if you got a little kid who tends to wander into the street and it's gonna get run down by the cars if I can make him stop by telling him terrible stories of what happens when you get run down by cars, it's the only thing I can do, I would do it. But I don't think it's the way for a sound spiritual. Well, of course, it depends on your beliefs about spiritual things. I'm going by things like what people bring back from the near-death experiences and other mystical experiences where they say the universe is basically intelligent and loving. If that's the case, manipulating people by fear doesn't seem like the way to go. On the other hand, if the universe is a struggle between a good God and a bad God and demons and angels and so forth, people probably think they're doing the good thing by making you afraid of the bad guys and getting rid of them. But it's, it's, it's tricky. It gets into psychopathology and all that. Now, I haven't given you a good answer unless my confusion when I'm supposed to be somewhat expert about this is an answer of sorts. I thought that was a very good answer, actually. And um, now here I'm going back to an earlier topic. Madeline Freeman says, do you think consciousness is primary? And I know the very first question, as I recall, you talked about the uh, Institute for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Science. So uh, maybe you can answer the, the question uh, in relationship to that. Yes, I do think that. I think it primarily as a scientist, okay? As a scientist, I have theories about the way things are. Uh, you can call them beliefs if you want. The question is how attached do I get to them, okay? I can't prove that consciousness is primary. What I can prove by referring to actual data is that consciousness, the mind, our intentions can do things that shouldn't happen in an ordinary view of the material world. So for instance, if you set up a telepathy experiment and you've done it right, there's no way information from the sender can get to the receiver by any known material means. And yet sometimes it gets there, often enough that we know there is such a thing that we could call telepathy. 
But if you get too attached to any theory, then you're getting into the belief realms and it's not science anymore. Uh, I've heard it described as one of the beauties of science is that a Nobel Prize winning physicist can come to your university and be manifesting in front, telling you how things work, writing equations on the board and all that. And a first year graduate student can raise her hand and say, doctor, I think there's a mistake in your third equation there. Could you check that? And if there's a mistake, the graduate student is right, not the professor. This doesn't work in most religious circles. Uh, if, if you start, <laughs> you get up in the middle of religious service to say, Rabbi, Father, I think you got this part wrong. You're usually not going to be welcomed. And yet, I think we very much need something like that. I think, in a sense, we need an an experimental religion or an experimental spirituality where, yes, we've got a lot of ideas from various spiritual traditions about things that may lead to very important experiences. But instead of taking any one of them and say, that's the sacred one, that's the final truth, let's check variations of it. Let's see what it actually does and so forth. Then I think we can eventually come, be, come to spiritual systems that work better for most people. Because think of it this way. Uh, when I read in Buddhism, for instance, I read all these stories about these wonderful masters who became enlightened over the last 2,500 years. I don't read any stories about the uh, many other monks who didn't get enlightened. How effective is it? Uh, <clears throat> sure, you hear the success stories. But is it really a very effective way for training people? I'd like to see that research. So I think consciousness is primary in the sense that this idea that it will be explained away by physics and chemistry someday, that goes against the data we have, okay? Maybe, I mean, I can't predict what we'll know 100 years from now. But to refuse to look at data as many pseudo-scientists do. These, these are scientists who call themselves scientists and they are in their own field. But when they dismiss the data on consciousness being something of a reality, the data of parapsychology, I think they're pseudo-scientists then because a scientist always has to put what the data show first, not what you believe, not what feels smart to you, but what the data shows. That's the primary way you get answers. Oh, we're getting lots of good questions uh, at this point, and, and they're related to this very topic. So uh, we'll keep probing deeper. Here's but one from- I am, I am getting a little tired, Jeffrey, and there are other, there's other stuff I need to do. So we might go for 10 more minutes or something like that, and then we can do another show sometime if we want. I that's just fine, Charlie. I'm happy to. I'll continue with and uh, anyhow uh, up until uh, half past uh, the top of the hour. Yeah, uh, I'm observing my own mind enough to know that the quality of what I can share is is starting to go down a little, and I don't want to do that. No problem whatsoever. Um, here's a question from S. Hamed Kazamini. He says, "Hello, Dr. Tart." you have successfully proposed a theory of consciousness with some sort of consciousness energy. How does conscious energy interact with physical energy given the limitations of thermodynamics? I have no idea. I, I wish I could give you a good answer to that. I can. Okay. I mean, I, I talk about the energy of consciousness simply because in a very conventional way, I think if something happens, something made it happen. Things don't just happen spontaneously by themselves. If something moves, a force pushes on it or something like that. So if consciousness thinks something or causes something to happen, you can see that as energy. I don't know enough to specifically talk about what the quality of this energy may be there. I think it can be very large energy once in a great while, 
the laboratory studies, it's usually a very small amount of energy. And that may be because the laboratory studies don't bring it out. I, I would also note that human history is such that still in some parts of the world, and certainly even in the Western part, it was only a few hundred years ago, we burned people at the stake that we thought could manipulate conscious energy and do us harm. That there is a good reason to deny having any psychic abilities. One of the most interesting psychic experiments, for instance, was done in order to get rid of this problem. Um, the man's name is floating in and out of my head and not quite sticking. But he thought about the early mediumistic days of table tilting and things like that. And thought maybe one of the reasons it could occur was the social climate was much more open to spiritualism. Bachelor. Yeah. You talk about talking with spirits now, they send you to a psychiatrist, not to a mediumistic training school. So he set up a little experiment where half a dozen people would be sitting around a table in the dark to see if, and singing hymns the way they used to do to get this to happen and hoping the table would move. But one of the people would have been randomly chosen to be the cheater. This would be the person who once in a while would use her knee to make the table move or something like that. But other people would think maybe the spirits did actually move it. By not making anyone obviously responsible for this, maybe our psychic energy could come out. This is a very tough issue of how do you take responsibility for psychic energy? I've certainly advise people who've talked with me over the years that if you think you're psychic, be very careful who you sell this to. Some people are going to be very upset by this. Uh, can you do one more question, Charlie? Sure. Okay, this is from Samim, who says, given your Aikido practice, what is your view on ki? Ah, uh, qi for those who don't know it, or qi for the more Chinese pronunciation of it, is some kind of psychic energy which it's believed that really good martial arts practitioners use. So, for instance, if I was, I, I did Aikido for a number of years, wonderful thing to do. So, if somebody was attacking me, I would try to perceive it not simply as a physical attack, as a grab or a punch or a swing or something like that, but to see that a person was manifesting energy. If somebody is punching, they're projecting energy forward. They need to project it at the camera to actually do anything. Now, one of the ideas in Aikido is you stay calm and centered, but you see which way the energy is going and you blend with that. I can't blend with myself very well. So. And then you lead that energy on in a way that neutralizes the attack without you getting all angry and worked up and things like that. I do not know whether there is genuinely an energy there or if it's a visualization strategy that makes your body move better. Certainly, I found that my body moved better, more smoothly, more coordinated if I visualized energy of this sort. I don't know of any definitive data that could test this energy without having the psychological factor. I know how it could be done. So for instance, uh, I hear about various martial arts masters who push like that, they're 10 feet away from a student and the student falls over. Well, the student has been trained to fall over. So you could easily say, this is psychological or maybe it's some kind of energy. Well, okay, let's put a, a, a cardboard wall in between so the student cannot see what the master is doing. If you now, and can't hear it, okay? If the student now falls over exactly when the master pushes, I'm going to say we've got a good argument for something independently real about psychic energy there. And I'd like to see that happen. That would be fun. That would be fascinating. 
But as it is, I think it's better to just take it as a way of training your physical movements to have you live in your body much better. And if you're doing a martial art like Aikido, to be more effective at it. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Many of the viewers are now expressing their thanks to you and their appreciation for all the work that you have done over so many years. Uh, TJF says, you are one of our best intellects and it is so good to see you on this forum. And Andy Oxide says, Charlie is the man. Well, I, I thank you and I thank all of our viewers at this point. And I especially thank you, Jeff, and would like the viewers to thank you too. Because I know the effort you put into producing these programs for what, 30 years now? So a long, a long, long time, longer than that, actually. Yeah, yeah. And it's been the best educational activity dealing with parapsychology and consciousness that I know of. So thank you for producing this show. Good luck on many, many more. Well, I uh, would be delighted to. Life in any future ones. I would be delighted to have you back again uh, uh, in the future, and, and we'll do it. Okay. And, and for the viewers, I'll stay on for another half hour because there are many co more questions coming in at, at this point and I'll do my best to address them. But uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you, Charlie. And best of luck. I know you're expecting gale force winds there in Berkeley and the risk of fire. So uh, yeah. uh, it, it messes up of ordinary life. I'm, I'm very grateful that we were able to have this time together. Likewise. Okay, well, uh, we'll continue. Then uh, I, I will uh, field some questions. And we, uh, unfortunately, uh, Charlie, uh, who was 10 years older than I am, uh, really felt... Uh, that an hour was about right for him. But there are one or two questions that I think I might even be able to answer a little better uh, than Charlie. Uh, somebody has asked, for example, who is the remote viewer who foresaw World War III with China? And uh, my answer is I never heard that from any remote viewer. But if I did hear of that from a single remote viewer, I, uh, I would take it under consideration. I wouldn't consider uh, it set in stone at all. Here is a question for, uh, from Lekestu, who asks, uh, why is observation so highly regarded in science? Why is not pure logic and probability ranking supreme? And, you know, science is an empirical method of inquiry. And empirical means you start with observation. You have to have observations. In parapsychology, this is very important because we have, for example, uh, Etzel Cardenia published an article in the American Psychologist in August of 2018. I quote it often uh, because it summarizes the results of 1,400 different experiments in parapsychology, empirical observations of psychic phenomena. And uh, the response to that paper by uh, James Alcock, a skeptic, who has been interviewed on this channel, a man I admire, but I thought the response was intriguing with regard to uh, your question, because he basically said, it doesn't matter how many good observations you have of psychic phenomena, as far as we're concerned, uh, based on our logic, it's impossible. So therefore it didn't occur. Well, Science doesn't operate that way. Science starts with observations, in my opinion, and in the opinion, I think, of most people who study the scientific method. There are people who argue 
that we really shouldn't be empiricists. We should fo focus on logic and uh, probability rather than empirical observations. And the reason they say that is they don't like, uh, they don't want to have to confront the very, very extraordinary things that people are observing. Uh, William Tell asks, Jeffrey, do you feel Ouija boards open the doors to other realms? Yes, I, th I think indeed they can do that, uh, sometimes for the best and sometimes not for the best. And I, I think people need to be careful. Um, I've told this story before, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, this occurred uh, with a person I met who told me they, they had been getting really good results on a Ouija board. And uh, uh, one time they got a, a message to show up at a certain street corner in San Francisco on a certain evening, at like at 3 a.m. And they didn't do it, but they read in the paper the next day that a murder had taken place. Well, I don't know, maybe they could have stop the murder had they been there, but uh, it's kind of scary, uh, the potential when you open yourself up to what we could call super sensible reality. It is not all angels in love necessarily. There uh, is an aspect, you could call it the lower astral plane, for example, where uh, you may run into uh, conscious entities uh, who have malicious intentions. Here is a question from Symbolic Space, who says they've just finished reading The PK Man and was wondering if I would share more about my experience with Ted Owen's hypnosis methods and the efficacy of some of the specific tools he had built into the system. And, uh, you know, uh, I actually have at the end of the book, and, and, and since you finished reading it, you've come upon it, the word for word uh, hypnotic suggestions that he gave me when I took his hypnosis training program. Uh, you know, it's intriguing because he, he asked me at the time, what, what would I like to accomplish with psychokinetic training? And I thought about it for a bit and I told Ted Owens that I didn't really want to do the things he was doing, which is controlling the weather and power blackouts and tornadoes and UFO sightings and very dramatic things. I said, I'd like to use psychokinetic abilities to become a better communicator to the public at large about the realities of psychic functioning. And it was within a few weeks of having completed that training that I launched my first television show, the original Thinking Aloud series. And, and I've been at it um, intermittently, but uh, pretty much ever since. And now this particular iteration, the new Thinking Aloud channel, is, is also an outgrowth of that very same impulse. So I have a good feeling about uh, those hypnosis methods. And even though I, you can look back and many people think, and I can't disagree with them, that Ted Owens misused some of his abilities, I think his basic methods were solid. And here is a question from Julie Tasker. What is science? How do you allow yourself to go beyond being too attached to data? It's a, it's a great question. And I think one way to think of it is, is this, that science is a method of inquiry. It's a little different for each branch of science. For example, experimental psychologists or parapsychologists use very, very different methods than uh, scientists in astronomy or in biology. Every science has, has its own methodologies. But these days, the orthodox view of science uh, is pretty much developed by the philosopher Karl Popper, who says that what you do is, is you, you observe and then you formulate hypotheses and then you test 
those hypotheses by seeing if you can falsify them. That uh, science basically, the essence of science is to try to falsify your hypothesis. You form a theory and you try to prove it wrong, <laughs> basically. Now, how do you go beyond being too attached to the data is very interesting. And I think maybe the best way to put it is to understand that while science is absolutely a fabulous way of uh, gathering knowledge, it's, I think, beyond doubt, the best way we have to gather knowledge. It's not the only way, and it's not necessarily the ultimate way that science itself is embedded in larger systems, for example, spirituality. I think, uh, you know, scientists sometimes get wrapped up in the identity uh, of themselves as a scientist. Uh, somebody asked Charlie Tart earlier, what about angels? Do you talk to angels? And he said, I can't do that. I'm a scientist. I'd lose all credibility if I started to talk to angels. If I ever saw an angel, he said, I would never tell anybody. It would be, the, even though here he is, an emeritus professor, <laughs> he, people will stop listening to me. He, he, he said, if I tell him, I'm, uh, if I ever saw an angel, I'd have to keep it a big secret. Uh, well, I guess you could say that that has to do with his, his identity as a scientist is so primary for him. So to, to get beyond uh, that, you have to find a larger identity to realize that as a human being, you're much larger than your identity as a scientist even, or your identity as a parent, or as a child, or as a brother, or a sister, or a friend, or even uh, your identity as a child of God. You're larger than all of those things. And I suppose that's by self-exploration, we learn to go beyond being too attached to uh, any particular uh, identity or uh, quality of uh, data, if you're in science, that we, we might look to. Here is a question from Jan Kilvin. As a psychologist, is the dark night of the soul more than just a psychological experience potentially? Well, I, I would have to say so because the, the very phrase dark night of the soul appears in the spiritual literature. I don't think it comes up, I'd be wrong because I haven't really acquainted myself thoroughly with all the literature on depression. Uh, people who experience depression, well, you know, they get suicidal uh, at times. And of course, every year, tens of thousands of people in the United States do commit suicide and have that psychological experience. But in the mystical tradition, the dark night of the soul is thought of a little differently. It's part of a process that if you stick with the process leads to awakening. Now, the irony is that psychologists also talk about uh, that kind of an experience. Some branches of psychology do. You know, um, psychology is a very diverse field. So for some people, if you're experiencing the dark night of the soul, you'll go see a psychiatrist who'll give you an antidepressant and say, you know, call me in a month. Uh, but there's a whole school of, many schools actually, of psychology. There's the anti-psychiatry school, which would say, if you're having that experience, let's work through it. Let's see if you can achieve a breakthrough. And uh, that's really uh, very similar to the way the mystical tradition looks at it. Uh, you know, the, the dark night of the soul is sometimes considered a, an essential element of mystical practice that uh, Rudolf Steiner sometimes uh, refers to it in terms of initiation. And in an initiation, as Steiner describes it, 
for example, you encounter horrific, frightening beings. Well, they're, you could say they're aspects of yourself, or you could say these are autonomous spiritual entities that you have to wrestle with. Uh, so I think you can look at it both ways. I don't think that the psychological perspective is invalid, and, and I don't think that the spiritual perspective is invalid either, and, and sometimes they overlap with each other. Okay, here's another question. Shadow Wolf asks, is there any credible research to access about the existence of psychic abilities? If so, can we have a look? The, uh, the best article on that that I'm aware of, of course, there are many, many, many books and uh, many, many interviews on the New Thinking Aloud channel. But if you want credible research, I would uh, give you as a starting point the article by Etzel Cardenia that appeared in August of 2018 in the American Psychologist, the flagship journal of the American Psychological Association, in which he cites meta-analyses, many different meta-analyses covering different research paradigms in parapsychology, overall covering over 1,400 different experiments that have been published in parapsychology. Now, if you're at a university, of course, you can access that through your university library. However, uh, otherwise, you can go on the web to the American Psychologist, August 2018. You can buy the article. It's $30, I think. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't have uh, access, you can send me an email to friends at newthinkingaloud.com. And I can send you a copy of the article. It's copyrighted, so I can't just distribute it to everybody, but I can send it to individuals who might want to have it and don't otherwise have access to it. And, you know, while I'm giving you that information, which is contact information, friends at newthinkingaloud.com. Let me also just briefly put in a plug for our weekly newsletter, the Thinking Aloud channel, the new Thinking Aloud channel. There is an old Thinking Aloud YouTube channel as well uh, of videos that I made between 1986 and 2002. But on the new Thinking Aloud channel, we produce a weekly newsletter. It's free and you can get it by going to our foundation website, New Thinking Aloud, all one word, and aloud is spelled A-L-L-O-W-E-D, newthinkingaloud.org. That's the New Thinking Aloud Foundation. And there you can subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. I think you'll find it very informative and inviting. So I'd like to encourage you to, to do that. Samim asks, what do you think we will call parapsychology today uh, will be mainstreamed? What we call parapsychology today, will it be mainstreamed in the next 50 years? And what would be called parapsychology after that event? I personally, I like the name parapsychology. I've gotten accustomed to it, though very few people in the field seem to like it as much as I do on the one hand. On the other hand, ever since I've been involved, there have been discussions, should we change the name? And nobody can come up with a better name. I like it because it, it reminds me of the Buddhist prajna paramita, the wisdom of going beyond. Uh, I, I like that idea. That's what para means, beyond, beyond psychology, for example, beyond conventional personal psychology. Actually, probably psychology, which means the study of the soul. 
is, is equally important. And ultimately, I suppose parapsychology will become uh, integrated into many other fields of science, physics, psychology, biology, education, and so on. But there'll always be room for a discipline of parapsychology. And one of the reasons that I host the new Thinking Aloud channel on YouTube is because I believe the day will come in the future when there will be departments of parapsychology in universities and colleges all across the world. Right now, there are a handful across the world. Uh, and when that day comes, all of these videos, this archive with uh, the wonderful people who are doing research in the field today uh, will be available as a resource. That's why I do this. Martha Lyle, Marta Lyle asks, how important is a gauge symmetry, and in parentheses, U2, conditioned lab or space to the co coherence of a human intention? And she's referring to the work of Dr. William Tiller. And uh, I don't understand Dr. Tiller's work well enough. I've got to bring him on uh, or some of his staff people on and, uh, to this program, and, and I could say more about it. But uh, what I do know about it is that he has people focus their human intention on uh, devices, let's say a microchip or a computer memory device. So it's been charged with human intention, much the way people sometimes try to charge crystals or charge water through uh, their focused human intention. I don't know uh, about the laboratory conditions or gauge symmetry or any, anything of that sort, Marta. Uh, it's, it's beyond me, really. But I think Dr. Tiller's research has been uh, replicated. I, and I'm pretty sure Dr. Tiller received a, a large grant for his work from uh, Buck Charlson, the fellow who founded, funded the uh, Intuition Network, the nonprofit organization of which I was president for many years. So uh, I have a positive feeling about Dr. Tiller's work. It's been described several times on this program, in particular in interviews with Beverly Rubick, who uh, pursues that area very carefully. So you might wish, if you haven't already viewed the Beverly Rubick interviews, I would encourage you to take a look at those. Esoteric Gold asks, what is your opinion on Egyptian spirituality and the idea of being able to traverse the afterlife with their technology? I am not very aware of uh, their technology, ancient Egyptian technology, but I can say I've visited Egypt a few times. I've had the experience of being inside the sarcophagus that is in the king's chamber of the uh, big pyramid, the pyramid of Cheops in Egypt, the great pyramid. And uh, in gr with groups of people, almost everybody who has that experience reports something almost identical, which is you, you lay down in that sarcophagus and the next thing you know, you're floating through outer space. It's really quite uh, consistent and, and quite amazing, but that's not quite the same as the afterlife. Maybe uh, I didn't stay in long enough, but I will say this, and I've actually recently done a in-presence monologue about it. I do think that we can explore the afterlife. I do think that there are ways to do it. For example, I've interviewed William Van Gordon, a Buddhist meditation teacher and a researcher who did research with advanced Buddhist meditators to experience what he called meditation-induced near-death experience. So there are a variety of not ancient Egyptian technologies, but contemporary technologies involving meditation, involving lucid dreaming, 
potentially involving psychedelic drug use or uh, self-hypnosis or remote viewing. And I can imagine sending teams of psychonauts together to uh, actually in a very rigorous way using the uh, consensus protocol methodology developed by Stefan Schwartz. He calls it the Mobius consensus methodology and he's been a guest on this channel many times. In fact, in two weeks, we will be doing a live stream event with Stefan Schwartz. It's a good thing to mention it now. It's scheduled for Sunday, the 8th of November. Uh, and we'll talk about that, uh, the ap potential application of the methodologies that he has developed for exploring the afterlife, exploring the future. He, he's done a lot of work uh, looking at remote viewing of the future. Uh, I think uh, I think we have very very promising tools available to us. And now I know we have just five minutes left. I want to thank all of you who have been part of this live stream event. I want to thank our volunteers. We have a team of volunteers helping to field the questions and share them with me, so I don't have to look at that chat window which goes so fast. Uh, and I'll take a few more questions while the uh, time remains. Twin Dennis asks, which are the conditions by which one can enter into a flow state known as the zone? Also, which seem to be the conditions that sustain this particular state? Well, a good question, Den uh, Twin Dennis. And uh, in fact, I had the privilege of interviewing Mihai Chikzet Mihai, the psychologist, uh, University of Chicago, as I recall, who wrote the book, Flow. And uh, I have his advice I can pass on to you, which is this. What you want to do is take on tasks or projects that you know you can do. You don't want to stretch yourself too far. You know, for example, levitating a table might be too much of a stretch for some people. Uh, but uh, whatever area of interest, it could be athletics, it could be literary or artistic or musical or uh, some sort of intellectual project, a science project. Uh, one of his main pieces of advice is start where you know you can already be successful and just stretch yourself a little bit. Don't try and you know jump to do something way beyond what you already know you can do. That'll give you the confidence uh, that is a prerequisite for entering into the flow state. So uh, I thought that was a very valuable piece of advice from the man who wrote the book, Flow. And let's find a, another question. Here's one from Julie Tasker who says, science needs to update to honor human experiences of life beyond logic. How do you see that unfolding? Well, I don't know that I can prescribe Julie for all of science what they need to do. Uh, what I think we all can do is, is what I'm doing with you right now. We all need to talk about our human experiences. We need to share as widely as possible what we really experience, what life is really like for each and every one of us. And uh, what I find, of course, is that people are experiencing a wide range of extraordinary experiences that go beyond conventional knowledge. Now, sometimes they get misinterpreted, but the basic experiences are still very real. And uh, that's why I do this video channel on YouTube. And uh, I hope that uh, the conversation keeps going. And, and uh, 
we're very fortunate. I think we reach about 10,000 people every day on the New Thinking Aloud channels. So uh, the more that people allow these experiences to enter into the conversation, uh, then they become, just by talking about them like this, they become embedded in our sense of reality. Well, time is just about up. Uh, once again, I want to thank all of our viewers. This program, of course, will be archived and available to the general public uh, as a permanent record. Uh, it's a, been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we uh, hope to continue to do live stream events basically every other Sunday uh, like this. And um, I'm getting to the point where if we're not doing a live stream event, every day of the week will be either a New Thinking Aloud interview, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and on every other Sunday, a, an in-presence monologue. So let me leave you with a question, as I like to do in my monologues. What can you do to help the conversation along? What can you do to bring greater awareness of wider realities into our public field of discussion? Thank you, everybody, for being with me and for being with Dr. Tartt.